right, good evening, everybody. We've got a great crowd tonight. We'd like you to stand, if you would, please. Let's begin by singing. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. Let's sing. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross He suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With His blood He purchased me. On the cross He sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will praise my dear Redeemer, His triumph. And power I'll tell how the victory he giveth over sin and death and hell. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt. I will sing of my Redeemer and His heavenly love for me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with Him to be. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer, with His blood He purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. Well, thank you, Pat. Appreciate the good singing tonight. Welcome to Bible Baptist. We have a number of guests with us, and we want to welcome them. Dr. and Mrs. John Huffman, welcome Back to Bible Baptist, you were with us Sunday morning, a joy to have you back on Wednesday night. Are you moving back from North Carolina? Oh no, I don't want to get any rumors started here, that's great. Hey. Well, listen, no, no, we understand. Good to see you both. Good to have Karen and your mom and dad with us as well. We welcome the Huffmans and your parents. Then, Tim, you've got your mom and dad here. I, I had them coming out of Pennsylvania, and they clarified, no, they're coming out of Arkansas. And I thought maybe they're going to move here as well. But, uh, hey, we welcome you folks. It's always a joy to have you in the service. Then, we're so pleased tonight to have as our special speaker, Brother Bill Patterson. He was telling me tonight before we prayed together that this ministry has supported them, our local church, for right at 20 years. And uh, what a great testimony of God's people for many, many years, long before I was ever the pastor here. And I found out he was going to be in the area. He reached out to me. He was coming to town to take care of some things. And I said, hey, he said, I'm going to be in church Wednesday night. And I thought, hey, we can't have Bill Patterson here without having him preach. I want to say he is a gifted linguist. And uh, God has given him a wonderful ministry to go to foreign lands, literally, and to take their language and to translate it. Uh, to translate the Word of God into their native tongue. And so you're in store for a great blessing. Now, I was talking to him just before the service, and he said to me, hey, if you ever have the opportunity to greet Dr. Del Johnson, I want you to be sure and do that for me. And I said, hey, I not only will do it, but I can have his son do it for you. Hey, we're so pleased to have Ben and Jill and... Uh, yeah, Lucas, good to see you. Good, good. You're five, right? Yeah, that is good. And your new little brother as well. And uh, they're down visiting his mom and dad who live in White House, and we're just so pleased to have all of them. We're looking forward to a wonderful evening tonight. We appreciate those who are joining us by means of the live stream. I got uh, just a number of things to tell you that we're excited about. The building's almost done with the painting, and we'll be saying a little bit more about that. But uh, we're going to open with a word of prayer, and Brother Aaron Snodderly, we you come tonight and lead us in prayer as we begin. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and Lord, we thank you for saving us and for another opportunity to be in church. We thank you for all the exciting things that are happening here in Hendersonville, Tennessee, and Lord, we pray that you would bless our Camp Crusaders. We pray for our vacation Bible school coming up. 
And Lord, we just pray that you would use it to bring many children to you. And Lord, as you suffered them, may we suffer them as well. And so, Lord, we pray that they would have their eyes turned upon Jesus at an early age and live for you with all of their hearts and lives. Lord, we thank you for the visitors here, here today and for the church members who are faithful as always. Lord, please bless us through the singing and the preaching of your word. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue singing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. My light, my strength, my song is sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. He's a cornerstone, he's high ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. We are excited about this coming Sunday, God and Country Sunday at Bible Baptist. Now, I need to tell you, we've been working on getting some people to come who are involved in the political scene. Aaron has helped me greatly. Aaron Snodderly has reached out through his contacts in the state and has been in contact with William Lambreth, who is the, I'm going to let you explain exactly here. He's the House Majority Leader. And you're saying one of the most influential politicians in the state of Tennessee. Yes, sir. Yes, and he's agreed to come. Our own local mayor, uh, Jamie Clary, is going to be here. We're excited about that. William Slater, who was our head of school for approximately uh, two decades and is uh, running for the Tennessee House, and we're praying that he'll get elected, and he's going to be here to give a word of greeting. Uh, we have reached out to the local fire department because we just want to help a group of first responders. And the fire chief called me today and said, hey, Pastor Much, uh, we're going to have a group there on Sunday. He said, uh, as I told you earlier, I'm calling to confirm we are going to bring two fire trucks with us. 
And he said, I want to come and meet you at 1 o'clock tomorrow, and I want to have the trucks positioned, as I said to you last week, in case there's an alarm, and, and they have to take off out of the service. And as I told you, that'll be exciting if that has to happen. But uh, no, 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 we'll, we'll just see. But we're going to have a great time. And uh, hey, we've got Bibles, and Lillian's helping us put calligraphy in these Bibles, these beautiful New Testaments. And we're going to give Bibles to the politicians, to the, to the first responders, and, uh, and we're just going to have a great time. Dr. Jim Shetler is going to be here. He loves to preach on God and country. This is one of his specialties, and he's, uh, I know, going to be a blessing to us. And then Jarrett Grubbs is coming. He's going to be doing a number of things, actually bringing his own sound guy along to run his soundtracks, and we're, he's going to be our special music for the morning. And then we're going to have a picnic afterwards. So uh, Publix Fried Chicken, you ladies, uh, will be providing uh, the, all the beverages, including uh, sweet tea. Uh, you know, as I told you, I was just in Chicago, and they're serving tea, and I'm like, man, this isn't southern tea. This isn't sweetened up. But hey, we're going to be serving southern sweet tea here on Sunday, and, and what a, just a great time we're going to have. So I want to say, you, you get these cards, and you know how it is. This is the type of thing, on the 4th of July, people, people say, hey, I'm not sure we're going to go do the fireworks. Then you know what, honey, you want to do the fireworks? Let's go. They all jump in the car and go off and do the fireworks. So you know what you need to do? You need to pass these cards out. Everywhere we're going, we're passing these cards out. We've got uh, quite, a, quite a presence on Facebook as we're uh, uh, inviting people. And uh, you'd be surprised. You give this to people, put it in people's hands, and you may be just surprised at how many people will come and be with us Sunday morning, hear the gospel, and uh, we'll see how the Lord's going to work in wonderful ways. Now, we're getting ready for VBS. And I know what you're thinking. We don't have many of these left. I appreciate the great response of you taking these yard signs. And uh, as I said, put them not parallel to the house, but perpendicular to the house so people can see them on, on both sides. But uh, hey, some of you said, Pastor, we took them home, but we can't get them in the ground. And uh, I asked the guys to go out and put the, the interns, put the flags out along the roads today. They came back and said, hey, Pastor, can't do it. The ground's like concrete. I said, hey, go talk to Papa John, get a long screwdriver, get a hammer, drive a, drive, drive a hole in the ground, and then get water pour water on it and, and get the flags installed. So as you, as you drove in tonight, you see the beautiful flags. So hey, you can do the same thing. Fortunately, we don't have many of these left. All we have left are, are those that are, that are by the door tonight. Appreciate all those uh, people who picked them up. But if you've not yet picked one up for VBS and put it in your yard to advertise, uh, be sure to do so. Okay, take your prayer list if you would. Praises, we're rejoicing that another student was saved in Camp Crusader. RJ reported to me that means nine that we've had uh, saved so far. Uh, I, I, I called Clay and, and said, hey, how are you doing down at the ranch with the kiddos? And he said, hey, we're doing great. And uh, he said, pray that uh, the kids in our, our cabin will all come to know the Lord as personal Savior. And one of the children in our group, not a member of our church, but one of the kids who was invited and went with our group, he texted me back after the fact and said, hey, he just has received the Lord as personal Savior. And so, hey, hey we, uh, we rejoice in that praise tonight. We want to pray for Neil Taylor and his family. Neil has been pretty much out of pocket, uh, trying to be certain that he did not take COVID home to his mother. And now she has uh, gotten sick and passed away. I believe she was 90. God gave her a, a good long life. The visitation tomorrow is from 10 to 1 at Cole and Garrett Funeral Home. I know many of you work, but uh, as a pastor, I always appreciate seeing those of our church members who can come by at these times in the hour of grief and uh, be a consolation to Neil. Neil loves our church, and now that she's passed, we'll be seeing more of him back here, and we've missed him. The funeral is tomorrow at 2 o'clock at Madison Creek Baptist Church. So just take note of the fact that the visitation and the funeral and then the committal are in three different locations, which is, which is all very unique. We want to pray for Elise Applegate. She's just uh, been proceeding so very, very nicely. They're having uh, uh, good meetings on the road, the Applegates are, and she is scheduled to have surgery on both of her feet tomorrow at Shriners Hospital in Missouri. They are very optimistic about it. I was talking to Nick and Nona about it today at lunch in the cafeteria, and they're just really expecting a great outcome. And, uh, and we're so grateful for Shriners Hospital and, and for their involvement in the Applegate family all along. We want to pray tonight for Candace Johnson. She's the mother of Ben Howell's college friend. Uh, Candace has stage four pancreatic cancer, and of course you know 
any, any type of cancer is serious, but particularly cancer of the pancreas. By the way, uh, let, let me just mention to a couple men here, uh, I'm going to ask Patrick if he'll come and pray. We have one of our interns in here tonight, if he'll be one of the men to pray. And then uh, also uh, Tim, Tim Anschutz, if, uh, if you'd come and pray. We want to pray for Stephen Smith, uh, Stephanie Kaiser's brother. And uh, he found his stepson, Blake, dead in the backyard early Sunday morning. What a shock. Blake was only 24 years old, and we want to come beside this family here tonight and moving forward and pray for Stephen as well as his wife, Carrie. Tom Courtney, we want to pray for his continued recovery and uh, talk to Vanessa tonight, his daughter, and she said that he's doing well. They anticipate that he will come home tomorrow, and uh, we rejoice in that. We want to continue to pray for Pastor and Mrs. Friendsley. Karen told me tonight before church that they anticipate that they're going to be released, I think you said in early July, the 7th of July. Okay, Lord willing. And uh, he sent me a photo, and I called him and talked to him on the phone, and he just said, hey, I want out of here. He said, I'm not used to, uh, to this amount of inactivity, and I, I, I'm anxious to get back to things. And, but praise the Lord, they're recovering nicely, and let's remember to pray for the friendslies. We want to pray for Oscar and Elaine. Pray that they'll find a home in Ohio, and let's pray for Mrs. Husky's ongoing health needs. And uh, we rejoice in Sandy and Karen, who uh, are really involved in helping them empty out their house, and they've been collecting like all adults do their age, been collecting all, the, all of their lives, and they've been given books and all kinds of things to different people and are being a great blessing here along the way. As we said, we want to pray for Clay and Priscilla, all of the campers at, uh, who are at the Bill Rice Ranch. We want to pray for Cody and Julia Bird. They're returning to the States on July 1 due to complications with uh, Julia's pregnancy. And the doctor said, you want to have your baby in the States? Uh, you need to go back now, and so uh, that's exactly what they're doing. We want to pray, although it's not written on the list here, uh, for Michelle Tellman getting ready to go uh, very soon to Brazil, uh, and her daughter Amanda is going to be having her first baby. We mentioned Sunday night that we want to do the, uh, the equivalent of a, uh, of a card shower for her. Indeed, we sent an email with all the specifics on that. If, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask the office or ask Michelle, but uh, we just want to be a, a great blessing to Michelle at uh, this special time of her life. All right, as our men are getting ready to come, I wonder, are there other requests tonight that are not on the list that you'd like to have us mention? Doris. Yes. He won't do it. Okay. Doris, what is your son-in-law's name? Okay. Let's pray for Ray as a diagnosis here with prostate cancer and really needs a diagnosis of a doctor. And let's pray that, that he'll go and get that diagnosis. Thank you, Doris. Yes. Yeah. Joe Demmer is having surgery early tomorrow morning to re remove his gallbladder at, uh, at, at uh, the hospital in Gallatin. We'll pray for Joe. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Alex requesting prayer for his mother. Okay. Okay, for neuropathy. Neuropathy. There we go. Yeah. All right. We'll pray for that. Thank you. Alex, great to have you back. Yeah, we've missed you. Good, good. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, Aaron. And, and pray for Aaron's preacher friend who lost his wife of 67 years yesterday. And his name is Bob Ferguson. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pray for the election. The deadline to vote is to register is Tuesday. And uh, the voting will begin in three weeks. Okay. Aaron, thank you. How many join me? I've got an unspoken request tonight. How many would join me in saying, hey, pastor, I've got an unspoken too. Look around your brothers and sisters in Christ here. 
All right, we'll remember the many unspoken requests. All right, Patrick, uh, will you come lead us off tonight? Tim, you can come at the same time. And I'm going to remind both of you men, if you'll be sure to hold the mic up close here, then we'll be able to hear in the auditorium, and they'll be sure to hear you on the live stream. And uh, as I say every week, as you pray, uh, men pray audibly, we'll come alongside them praying in our hearts. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, Lord, we pray for Brother Neil Taylor and his family and the recent passing of his mother. Um, we just pray that uh, they uh, just, hey guys, they come through this time of grieving. Lord, just give them strength and give them uh, peace in their hearts, Lord. We also pray for Elise Applegate as she's got uh, an upcoming surgery on her feet. Um, Lord, just give her um, the ability, just recovery, and by the doctors, the um, ability to be able to just uh, um, do the surgery properly and uh, her to come out without any uh, unforeseen issues, Lord. We also pray for Candace Johnson as, uh, as a friend of uh, Ben Howell's college friend, uh, is her mother. Uh, she has stage four cancer, Lord. I know that is a very tough thing to hear, and uh, it is as you, you are the great physician, Lord. Um, if you uh, see, foresee her to be healed, um, you do that, Lord. But as the family prepares for that, um, that foreseen end, Lord, um, just give them peace and a good time to, uh, with her as they, uh, as they have those last moments, Lord. We also pray for Michelle Tellman as she's going to be leaving to be with Amanda. She's having her baby, Lord. Um, all of that and the travels and then also Amanda and just in the birth of the baby, Lord. Everything just goes smoothly and without any issues, Lord. We also pray for Miss Doris as her uh, son-in-law, Ray Rippey, he has cancer. Just give him, uh, give him maybe the eyes to open to see that uh, there's some things that they can do to, uh, to uh, rectify those issues there and um, help him to be able to be healed from that, Lord, as well. We also pray for Brother Joe as he has surgery tomorrow. Just give him, um, give the doctors grace and the ability to uh, perform the operation correctly as well, Lord. We also pray for Alex as his mother has neuropathy. I know that that is a, is a very um, strenuous um, disease and problem, Lord. Just help her to be able to be healed. Maybe get some rest and some, uh, some help with that, Lord. We also pray for Stephen Smith um, as he was, uh, as, his, um, as he found his stepson um, uh, dead recently, Lord. Just uh, pray for them as they're going through a time of healing and the family as well. We also just want to praise you, Lord, for um, another child that was saved at Camp Crusader and one that was saved at Bill Rice Ranch, Lord. We praise you for your work in those kids' lives. Allow them to be able to now be discipled and to be able to uh, choose a life that is for you, Lord. We thank you for what you've given to us and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just want to thank you for the honor and the privilege to come before you today, God. Thank you that, you're, that I can call you my father. And God, I'm thankful that you call me your son. Lord, I'm thankful for this church. So many things that you do for us, God. We're so undeserving, Lord. As we come to you today in prayer, God, there's so many needs. Your children are hurting, Father. The world seems to be spinning out of control. But God, we know that you are still in charge. You're still on the throne, Lord. God, I pray that you be with each and every unspoken request here, whether hands were raised or where they weren't. And God, I know that throughout, throughout this earth, there are children of yours that are hurting, God. And I just pray that you just put your hand on us, God. Watch over us. Take care of us. Meet these needs, Lord. Help us to turn back to you. God, I thank you once again for Tom Courtney and the surgery that seemed to go well, Lord, as he recovers in the hospital. Father, I pray that you'd be with him as he continues to recover. God, I pray that you take any pain away from him that he's got. And Lord, I just pray that you'd bring him home safely, help him get back to a normal life, God. And we know that you can do that. God, I pray for the Huskies. Lord, you know we love them, Father. I hate to see him go, Lord. He's been such a good servant of yours, Lord. I pray that you just make their way smooth, them to get back up north around their family, God. I pray that you'd be with him with his, his legs and the problems there, God. I thank you for the good news also about the Friendslies, that they're about to come home, Lord. I pray that you just continue to heal them, bring them back into the fold, God. I pray that you would just be with the doctors and be with everybody involved with them. I thank you for Brother Friendsley and his ministry and starting this church, God. And I thank you for what this church has stood for for all these years. God, I know that the devil hates this church. 
God, the devil hates any church that's preaching your word and seeing people saved. And God, I pray that you would just continue to keep your hand on this church, on our pastor, on the workers, on the church, on the school, each and every person that's involved here, as well as those that go here, God. These are tough times, God, and we look to you for that. God, I pray that you'd be with Clay and Priscilla, as with the young children at the Bill Rice Ranch, God. I thank you that one of those young people has already professed his faith in Christ. God, I pray that you'd be with the rest of them, not just our group, Lord, all those kids, God. I would pray that they'd get that foundation, God, that they need, and that their eyes and their hearts would be open so that they could see their need for Christ, God. I thank you for young people that are able to confess you and profess you and turn their lives over to you at an early age and they'll live their lives for you and not have to get messed up in this world to do that, God. And I just pray that you would just perform a miracle, be with the preachers that are there, be with everything that goes on. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you just take control of that entire camp this week and every week that it's going on. God, I pray for Cody and Julia Bird. I thank you for their sacrifice and being willing to go to another country to give the gospel, Lord, away from their family and their friends. And I pray that you be with Julia with this pregnancy, Lord. I pray that they'd get back here without a hitch. God, that everything would work well with their flights. And God, I pray that she'd come back here and she'd be comfortable and everything would go well for them, Lord. And Once again, I thank you for them and I pray that your hand of blessing would be on them. Lord, I pray for this preacher, Bob Ferguson, who lost his wife. God, I can't imagine how hard that is to have somebody by your side each and every day and then to wake up one morning and they're not there anymore. And we know, God, that they're in a far better place, but we still miss them, Lord, and that's hard for a pastor. He still has to go on. He has a ministry, and I pray that you continue to be with him and his ministry. God, please send that comfort that only you can give, that peace that passes all understanding that only comes from you, Lord, and I thank you that... As a Christian, we can rely on that. And God, lastly, I pray for the voting and everything that's going on. I want to thank you so much because I know that this church pray for the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And I thank you, God, that that happened. And God, I pray that you just be with the voting and everything that goes on. This world seems to be in a mess and it seems to be getting worse. But God, if your people, which are called by your name, will turn from their wicked ways and acknowledge you God I know that you can do something I know that you still have something left for us and I know there's something for us to do and God I pray that it would start with us here in the house of God thank you once again for all you do all that you're going to do and all that you have done Father we owe everything to you Lord help us to want to serve you more and more each and every day thank you once again I pray to be the preaching tonight be with each and every person that's here Holy Spirit, I pray that you just walk among these aisles and open our hearts so that we can hear from you because that's what we desperately need. In Jesus' name, amen. For the preaching night, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Sinners plunged beneath that blood Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains And sinners plunged beneath that blood Lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I go vile as he wash all my sins away. Stay.
stammering tongue, my silent in the brain. in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power. I'll sing thy power to save. Well, what a joy to be back at Bible Baptist Church. I have been so blessed by this church for so many years. For those of you who have never met me before, uh, I am a missionary. I'm a third generation missionary. And many of my family members are supported by your church. Some of you know Zach Gibson, who is one of the interns here. His parents, John and Joy Gibson, at the Shalom Baptist Church in Queens, New York City, working with Jewish people, are supported by this church. We've been supported by this church for about 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. And this church has also supported my parents. And so we are very, very grateful to the Lord for the ministry of this church uh, Brother Tony Applegate, who is out of this church, uh, I remember when he was leaving to go to Uganda the first time. That was very exciting. And uh, just as another small little note, he was my pastor's youth pastor in Texas uh, before dirt began. So um, it's just great to be here with you, and we're, we're very, very grateful for this church. Uh, Dr. Much was my homiletics professor when I was at Pensacola Christian College. That's right, he was. Was he yours as well? Okay, all right. And Dr. Dell Johnson taught me Bible doctrine, so if I do something wrong tonight, uh, it's my fault, not theirs. John chapter number four, John chapter number four. All right, turning in your Bibles, uh, are you grateful that you have God's Word? Can you imagine if you spoke a language that did not have the Word of God? Your, your language didn't have a Bible. Because I hope you realize that the Bible has been translated into, praise God, over 700 languages. 704 is the last that I've heard. But there are still today 3,879 languages that do not have one verse of Scripture. Not even John 3.16. Could you quote John 3.16 with me? I didn't hear anyone saying it with me tonight. <laughs> that was in Greek. In Hebrew, In Hindi, the Lord led us to Mongolia. We translated the New Testament already into Mongolian. We're working on the Old Testament from the original languages into the Mongolian language for the first time in history. In Mongolian, that verse says, In Spanish, Porque de tal manera amó Dios al mundo que ha dado a su Hijo unigénito para que todo aquel que en él cree no se pierda, mas tenga vida eterna. But say it with me in English, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you think God cares about people who don't speak English and who live in faraway places Places that to us almost seem reprehensible and dirty and filthy and undesirable. Well, with that in mind, we're going to look at such a place. In John chapter number 4, I'd like to draw your attention to verse number 4, where the Bible says, And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. 
Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, and from whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Heavenly Father, would you please guide and direct my thoughts as I preach your word for these next few moments. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand your passion, your desire, that every person on earth should hear the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you for what you're going to do this evening. In, God, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. We find here in this passage a woman who is speaking with Jesus, and the Bible tells us that this woman, when speaking to Jesus in verse number 9, says, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Oh boy, that, that, that's actually an understatement. So in order to understand that statement, we really have to look back into history a little bit and find out who the Samaritans were. The Samaritans were a half-breed. They were half-Jewish and half-Assyrian. They were intermarried between the Jews and the Assyrians after the first captivity when many of the Jews had been murdered by the Assyrians. Some were taken off into captivity in Assyria. And then there were a few soldiers that were left in the land of Israel along with some of the Jews that were there to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that the, the way Israel was led was according to the Assyrian government. Well, some of those Jewish women married the Assyrian soldiers that had been left behind. Imagine if our country was invaded by an enemy and they killed much of our population. They took some of your family members and, and took them into captivity as slaves to go back to whatever country that enemy had come from. And then one of your family members, a, a young lady, would marry one of those soldiers because of the comfort, because of the, the ability to have good food and a position and, and maybe just a comfortable lifestyle. And so she would betray her nation. And that's what the Jews feel about the Samaritans. And so as you look here at the Samaritans, you now find a group of people who... The children speak half in Hebrew and half in Assyrian. It's this new language that was sort of rather invented. They, they believe that the Pentateuch is the only part of God's word that is inspired. And so they have their own portion of scripture, and it's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. And it's translated into the Samaritan dialect. They gather every year on top of Mount Gerizim. There is a very small little village up on top of Mount Gerizim. It's called Kefar Luza. And every year, all of the Samaritans are supposed to gather there. I've had the privilege of seeing this with my own eyes when we lived in Jerusalem. There are about 800 of them. They come from two places. Most of the Samaritans live in a city called Holon in Israel. The rest of them live there in this small village up on top of the mountain. They get together. All of the families have to have a sheep. They will sometimes spray paint the sheep so that you'll know whose is whose. And then as the sun begins to go down and the chief priest of the Samaritans comes up and he makes a proclamation, they each family grab their sheep. The men are all dressed in white from a cap on the top of their, feet, uh, uh, on the top of their head all the way to the shoes on their feet, their pants, their shirt. Everything is all white. They then take the sheep. And they gather around this square altar. It's probably about 10 feet by 10 feet, much about the area right here. And, and they gather around and they, they lay the sheep down on their side so that the throat is, is right above where that there's sort of a, a little dip in front of the altar. 
and then they will take a very sharp knife and they will, they will slit the, the throat of that sheep and, and the blood just comes out and it, it gets all over their white raiment and as they begin to see the blood, they just shout for joy because according to their tradition, their sins have been atoned for one more year. How sad it is that they do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Most of us are familiar with Acts 1.8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Has anyone here ever heard of a missionary to the Samaritans? As far as I know, there is no one. My research shows that there is not a single missionary, nor has there been a missionary to the Samaritans. This group of people are very, very clannish. They don't want outsiders. Frankly, they would prefer us to forget about them. And yet, we find in Scripture, in John 4.4, 4, and he must needs go through Samaria. I wonder if John knew this because Jesus said something. There had to have been some way, possibly just the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but it is absolutely essential to this passage that Jesus was required, that there was this urgency and necessity for Jesus to go through Samaria. And if you were to pick any group of people on earth that the Jews would have preferred to avoid... It was this group. It was this group. I would ask you to think right now of perhaps a group of people that to you are the most detestable, despicable, undesirable people on earth. You might think of some warriors, maybe in the Taliban, perhaps whose goal in life is to see the destruction of our nation. And what would it take for God to change our hearts that we might desire to see their salvation? I wonder what it would take for us to get involved in their life. Today I'd like to speak on the subject of why I must be involved in missions. I find here in this passage that Jesus got involved in reaching the Samaritans. And I believe, first of all, it was because God has commanded us to be involved in missions. Why should we be involved in missions today, folks? Because God has commanded us to. Why, why should the, the apple gates go to Uganda? And why should uh, the birds go to the Dominican Republic? And why should the Talmans go to Brazil? And why should all of these people that have been sent out go to their respective countries to minister? Because God sent them there. See, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Remember when we lived in Mongolia for eight years, that felt like the end of the world. And for some people, they said it was the end of the world. But why did we go to Mongolia? Because God had sent us to that place. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Why should I get involved in missions? Because God has commanded me to. God sends us to places we don't like. God sends us to people that don't like us. God sends us to go preach a message that people don't want to hear. I remember early, early one Sunday morning, my wife and my daughter and I, we were getting into a taxi in Mongolia. Now, a taxi in Mongolia is any car willing to stop and pick you up, okay? You just put your hand out. If a car stops, that's your taxi. So we got in the back seat. There were two ladies in the front seats, and we got in the back seat, started off towards the church so that we could be at church that Sunday morning. And they asked me, they said, sir, uh, what kind of work do you do? I said, well, I'm a preacher, and I'm a Bible translator. Oh, oh. I said, have you ever heard about the Bible? They said, no, we've never heard about the Bible. What is it? 
I said, well, it's a book that God wrote. Oh, that's very interesting. I asked them, I said, what do you do? They said, oh, we're, we're shaman priestesses. Uh, we're basically witches. And uh, we're going to this restaurant, and we're going to perform this ritual to get rid of all the demons. I thought that was very interesting, you know, Satan casting out the devil. Um, but um, so, so they're on their way, and they said, and all that stuff in the back seat, those are for some of our potions. And they had all kinds of herbs and weird stuff and face masks, and it was, it was amazing. And, um, and I thought, Pastor Much, I thought, you know, I bet they've never heard the gospel before. And they had. They, hadn't even, they didn't even know what the Bible was. And so over the next few moments, as they drove us into the city, I told them what the Bible teaches about salvation. And they kept saying, we've never heard this before. This is very strange. You see, God sends us because they need to hear. And God has commanded us to be involved. Secondly, God is worthy that we should get involved. I want you to notice one verse. I'm not going to take the time to read the entire passage. But after Jesus and this woman began to speak back and forth, and then the disciples come back, and, and uh, they're seeing Jesus speak to the woman, and then all of a sudden the woman just leaves. Notice what it says in verse number 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the men. And, and so she, she recognizes, because she's talking with Jesus, and she says, well, I know that when Messiah comes that, you know, he will, you know, tell us all these things. And he says, I am that person. And she suddenly has her eyes open. She recognizes who Jesus is. And because she recognized who Jesus is, she leaves her water pot and she rushes into the city to go tell people, you've got to come see this guy. This is incredible. Would you agree with me that God is worthy that we should get involved? Can you imagine uh, meeting someone and not telling them about the Lord? And then one day in eternity as we stand before God and they look across and they see you and they're being judged to go into hell and we're called upon as witnesses and they say, hey, why didn't you tell me about this? Why, why didn't you tell me about God? Why didn't you tell me about salvation? And here we see that this woman, she quickly ran into the city leaving her water pot behind. Ladies, this would be kind of like, you know, leaving the house without makeup. I mean, this was huge. This was really big. There was an urgency here. Uh, th there was a necessity that was upon her. And she, she needed to get there as fast as possible. You know, there needs to be an urgency in our hearts to give the gospel to others. Uh, this desire, this priority in our life that we should talk to others about our Savior John the Baptist said about Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. When this Samaritan woman realized who Jesus was, boom, like a flash, she's out of there. She's headed to go to her village to tell people what was going on. I see a third reason why I must be involved in missions. Not only should I be involved in missions because God has commanded me to be involved, and secondly, because he is worthy that I should be involved, but third, because he'll use me if I'll get involved. Now, this woman, oh, man, Ah, I hate to tell you, but she was not the best candidate for the job, okay? If Bible Baptist Church says we're going to have an evangelistic thrust into White House, we're going to, White House is a little community here close by, how many people live there? Big city, uh, 10,000 people. Sure, 10,000, 20,000 people. Sure, let's be generous, 30,000. And um, so we're going to have an evangelistic thrust, and we're going to go into the city, and Pastor Much is going to select someone from the church to be in charge of the evangelistic campaign. And so he chooses someone who has been married five times and is currently living with a man that she's not married to. Is that who you would choose, Pastor Much? No, no. Did you realize that this woman who, who got used of God in a great way is not someone we would have chosen? I, I mean, when she tells Jesus, uh, I, I don't have a husband, and he says, well, you're right in a way. You've had five husbands, and you're currently living with a man that you're not married to. <sighs> wow. And yet she goes into the city. You know what I learned here about this? 
God is looking for people who are willing. Sometimes the best trained people aren't willing. But the least likely people, those are the ones that are willing. Isn't it amazing that even like God and Country Day, okay, there, there might be someone here that you would say, boy, that's the least likely person in the church, and they bring like 10 people on Sunday, and you just go, whoa, where'd that come from? You know, someone totally unexpected, and God uses them in a great way. Here's why. God uses us if we'll just get involved, if we'll just get involved. See, the, the verse that I mentioned a while ago, Acts 1-8, we will receive power. And the Holy Ghost will come upon us. And we will be witnesses. Hmm, but there's one thing. It's as we go. If we're sitting at home waiting for this miraculous transformation to occur, and all of a sudden I'm now this great evangelist that is going to go out and knock down doors and people are just going to flock to the church because of my testimony. That's not the way it works. This woman went and she had a bad testimony and she probably may have had a few people say, oh, why should we listen to you? And yet she was insistent. You have got to come here and see this man. Can I remind you of something? The 12 trained disciples went into the city and came back with not a single soul. They were more interested in getting groceries than they were in giving the gospel. And I'm afraid we're sometimes the same way. You say, what do you mean, Brother Bill? Oh, I don't want to step on your toes, but can I step on my own toes for a minute? On Sunday, when I get out of church, you know, when he goes over by five minutes, my pastor, he doesn't often, but sometimes he does. That's five minutes that we have to, you know, allow the assembly of God and the Lutherans and the Episcopalians and all the rest of them to get in line in front of us. And it's like an extra hour because of those five minutes, you know, and we're there in line and, oh man, and, and you're just starved to death. I mean, you know, Red Lobster's Cheddar Bay Biscuits are waiting and calling my name. And, uh, and so there we are waiting and we're like, oh, okay. We're more interested in getting food than we are in grabbing a track on our way out the door to make sure we have one to give to the waitress, the server. <sighs> yeah, we're the same. See, God is seeking willing people. He's seeking us, and he wants to empower us. He truly wants to use us, but we have to take that first step. I remember when I was asked to work on the translation of a Bible into Portuguese, and, and Dr. Much, I didn't speak Portuguese, so that was a small problem. But my uncle, Tom Gilmer, who's a missionary in Brazil, uh, he's rather insistent. And if he asks you to do something, he probably will ask you like 10 times. And then if you're not really sure you want to do it, he says, well, would you at least pray about it? I, that, that just kills me. And I said, sure, I'll pray about it. And I called him back a couple of days later and I said, I don't know how I can help, but I guess I'll try. Well, I worked from 1997 to 2011 on a translation of the Bible into Portuguese. I was their textual consultant. I learned a lot of Portuguese along the way too, by the way. Uh, I now go to Brazil and I preach without a translator. That's kind of fun. Um, and I've never taken one day of Portuguese classes, so to God be the glory. But um, as we began to work on this and as I began to, to get involved and spent time, my free time, I guess, uh, working on this translation into Portuguese, um, God began to, to do something. He began to use me, and I began to understand things, and I would point things out to the translation team and help them, and, and we were able to do a really great translation by God's blessing. But God doesn't use people who aren't willing. I could have told my uncle, no, I don't want to be involved in that. I could have walked away, and no one would have blamed me. I mean, I don't speak Portuguese. No one would have blamed me, but God was planning to use me. I wonder how many times God plans to use us, but because we don't get involved, we don't get that blessing. We walk away. We, we think we're justified. I mean, no one would criticize us for not getting involved, and yet we could have been greatly, greatly used of God.
But not only was this woman used, and the fourth reason why we should get involved is because God greatly blessed her. I want you to go with me, please, down in our passage here to verse number 39. The Bible says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, He told me all that, I, that ever I did. And then go down to verse number, well, let's read verse 40. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. Can you imagine the response of the Samaritans here? I mean, they're, they're flocking now to Jesus, and they're believing in him. Can you imagine the 12 disciples? Maybe Andrew and Peter talking to each other. You know, we could have tried to get somebody to come out here. I guess we should have probably done that, huh? John, you know, he's over there always scratching his head. Yeah, we, we could have gotten involved too, but we didn't. And they lost a blessing. The Bible says in Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and now that thou must observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt find good success. It's as we obey God's will and follow God's word that God gives us great success. He blesses us far beyond what we could ever imagine. And that's what happened here with this woman who was the least likely candidate, and yet God blessed her in an amazing way. You may be looking at yourself right now and say, Brother Bill, but you don't know me. I, I, I couldn't be used of God. I'm the least likely person in this church for God to use someone. And God's just looking for someone who's willing. And he's going to bless you. Not just use you, but bless you greatly. That New Testament that I told you about, that we were working on, oh, the Lord is blessed. We've now given out 5,000 New Testaments in Mongolian. In Portuguese, we've given away over 80 million New Testaments. As of now, 8.7 million whole Bibles have been distributed since 2011. I could have said no. I'm so glad I didn't. Can I ask you tonight if God maybe is asking someone here to get involved in telling other people about him and giving them the gospel because God wants to use you in an amazing way. He's commanded us to do it. He's worthy that we should do it. He will use us if we'll do it. He will bless us if we'll do it. I think one of the saddest stories that I've ever heard was the story of Kevin Carter. In 1993, some of you will remember a picture that he took. Kevin Carter was a South African photographer. And he took a picture of a child in Sudan who was crawling on mud and dirt, trying to get to a refugee camp. And as this child was, was crawling along, there was a buzzard behind the child. And the photographer was driving by, and he saw this child and the buzzard behind the child, and he jumped out, and he began to take pictures of, of this situation. And, and one of those pictures was so powerful, it won a Pulitzer Prize. After this picture came to be so well-known, there was an obvious question that people asked. Did you help the kid? Were you able to help the child? And after three months of questions, Kevin Carter took his own life. He didn't get involved. All he had done was shoo the buzzard away, but he had no idea. In 2009, 16 years later, the father of what was thought to be a little girl, who was actually a little boy, came forward in Sudan and said, that was my son. He did make it. He did survive. He later on contracted a disease, and he passed away in 2003. Huh. Time after time in the Bible, God records great stories of men who got involved and who God enabled and God blessed. I just wonder if he's waiting to write a new chapter. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. 
I pray that you would help us to consider our part in serving you. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, no one's looking. Anyone here say, Bill, God spoke to me tonight, and I know I need to get more involved in serving him. If that's true, would you just raise your hand with mine? I'd like to pray for you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, please, please help us to obey your will for our life. I love you, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Dr. Mark. And all God's people said, Brother Patterson, thank you so much. I'd like you to do me a favor. We're going to have, Lord willing, Missions Month next February, every Sunday. The last two Sundays are not filled yet. Would you check your calendar? See if you can come and be with us on one of those Sundays. God wants to use us. I was recently in a church building, and you've seen this. As I was walking out, looked above the door, and it said, uh, you're now entering the mission field. We don't have the sign, but that's where we go tonight. Pick up some cards. Let's invite people for Sunday, and let's trust God for a great day. Pat, I think we need to close tonight by singing our theme song, God is Good. And uh, I think it's a great way to close. Let's stand and sing it together. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. Thank you so much. See you Sunday. You are dismissed.